Will you pray with me, please? Open our hearts once more, merciful God, to the sparks of your presence still being revealed in this world and in this place. Open our eyes that we might see you as you see us. Illumine our hearts that we might live out the words your Son teaches us. And may my thoughts and my words today speak only of him, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. Every year on this last Sunday before the season of Lent begins, we celebrate what is known as the Transfiguration of Jesus. And every year, I wonder what can be said that hasn't been said before. I guess every Sunday is like that. But this Sunday seems to be near the top of the list, and I think I know why. I think it starts with the very you word we use for this Sunday, transfiguration. It's an odd word. I know what it means, but then again, not really. I know that it means to have one's appearance altered, one's figure altered, but that doesn't seem quite adequate enough for our Sunday morning definition. I often use the word transform when I think of something changing from one state to another, one appearance to another. Transform is a word I have come to associate with change, especially when thinking about spiritual change. A spiritual change that allows us to become closer to God, to feel like we have become closer to God. And how do we get there to this transformation of our lives to ultimately becoming closer to God? to live lives that where we actually feel closer to God. You know, one of my favorite quotes from the Bible uses this definition of, of change, transformation. It's Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I like that verse because it tells me that I don't have to stay in the, in the pattern of this world where I often stay too long. Stay in all the ruts that I get stuck in. All the day-to-dayness that I think is going to last forever. I end up doing the same thing over and over again. Wanting something different but not quite sure how to get it. More often than not, I'm not even sure what that something different is. I just know that a transformation is needed in my life. And so I go down this path that I've been down before. The only problem with going down this path of focusing on transformation is that I usually think of transformation as being something really grand and large. You know, something that will change my entire life, transformed into something brand new, an entirely new being. And when I start thinking that way, I immediately become overwhelmed, making it impossible for me to even imagine how to get started. And so, I do what I'm best at. I don't do anything. But rather, I just keep waiting and hoping that something will happen. And the thing is, I already know what is holding me back at these times. What is holding me back is that I think that it's all up to me and only me. 
to move myself forward, or at least get the ball rolling. You know, whether it be through increased prayer, you know, a Bible study, meditation and centering prayer, fasting, working with others, whatever it is that I've decided needs changing, I, I'll set off and try to change it. Only to get myself into that overwhelming, overwhelmed position rather quickly. And rarely, and in my case, never, has this ever worked out for me. And so I'll spend a whole nother year, one transfiguration Sunday to the other, trying really hard to change the way I feel, that feeling of being overwhelmed, so I can get back to the task of changing my whole life. Which, of course, only leads to more frustration and disappointment that I couldn't do it. Disappointment that I, I can't seem to do this by myself. Because no matter how much I believe God is with me, and I do, I still think that I have to do the initial work to prove somehow that maybe I'm willing to do it, humble enough to let God take over, maybe later on down the line, and, and that's just wrong. I like what Jesus said once to his disciples, that the kingdom of God is not something you can observe out there and say, well, there it is, or here it is, and then go after it. The kingdom of God is within you. He said. And I want that to be the turning point for today. Turning away from the idea of total transformation of our entire lives that we initiate to a transfiguration initiated by God. Now, every year I have to go and look up the word transfigure to remind myself, what does it mean? Because if it's not the same thing as transformation, which I still think is my responsibility, what does it mean? So I found this definition of transfiguration, a change in form or appearance, a metamorphosis an exalting, glorifying, even a spiritual change. That sounds good. Metamorphosis. But I thought maybe that's still a little too technical for today. So I, I went and found another definition. You know, if you don't like one, just find another one. <laughs> to transfigure is to change or alter something so that it becomes even more amazing and beautiful. And I like the word beautiful. It's one of those words that, that really does go deeper than just surface appearances. You know, when we look at someone or something that is beautiful, you know, we're doing more than just looking at it. When we look at beauty and then allow that beauty to not only, you know, be a reflection in our eyes, but then become an image stamped within us, on our hearts, on our souls, then we, we have allowed this gift of beauty that God has given us to become part of us. And while we do not own this beauty, we are allowed to participate in it. When the disciples looked up from the place on which they were standing, they watched as Jesus was transfigured before them. His appearance changed 
His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. In another gospel, Luke's gospel, he, he says a bit more, and he says, as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became bright white, and two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with him. As Jesus prayed, his appearance changed. From his face all the way down to the way he was dressed. And the ones with him appeared in glorious splendor too, talking with Jesus. You know, I've, I sometimes overlook and have been mystified by this appearance of these two men, Moses and Elijah, on this Transfiguration mountaintop. Actually, maybe overlooked isn't the right word, but what I most often do here is I think of this detail as something more academic to be explained than, than spiritual. You know, that Moses was there because Moses represents the Torah, the law, the religious practices and rules that, that define the Israelites. You know, those first five books of the Bible given to them by God as the chosen people of God. Moses, law, there he is. And Elijah was there because he represents the coming of the Messiah. You know, he was believed to be the one who will come and announce that a Messiah is on his way. He was expected to make that announcement. And so there he is on the mountaintop with Jesus and Moses, making the announcement that the Messiah is here. And the disciples, they're freaked out about this, don't know what to do, start making all sorts of foolish statements, because they didn't understand transfiguration any more than we do. In fact, they were so confused about what they were seeing, Jesus tells them, don't say anything about this until you can understand it. After Jesus is resurrected, from this life into what they were catching a glimpse of. So what does all this mean? As usual, when I was writing this this morning, I, I thought, well, now I'm writing in circles, so get to the point. The point is, I want to get around to talking about grief this morning. It seems that I've been confronted with grief more and more lately. Some of it my own, but mostly the grief of others. There have been several deaths of loved ones this year and last year. Even two, three, four, five years ago, even decades ago, that, that grief doesn't leave us. That's the most obvious form of grief, I think. One that is apparent to the rest of us when, you, when we look upon the suffering of another knowing their loved one has died. But there's other types of grief. We can experience grief over the loss of a relationship, where even though the person might not have died, that relationship has. We can grieve over dreams that we no longer dream. There's a line from the, the play Les Miserables that I like, it says, my life has killed the dreams I dreamed. We can grieve over situations we feel trapped in, hoping they might change, listening to everyone saying that one day they will change, but that doesn't change the way we feel at that moment. So as I sat and com contemplated and prayed about Transfiguration Sunday, I began to understand transfiguration a little better. Not because of something I thought of, but because I was praying about it. And I was gifted with a little bit more of an understanding that just as Jesus prayed before his transfiguration, you know, prayer, prayer changes things. Usually us. 
but it does change things. So I was, I was gifted, I realized, this morning with understanding something I didn't understand as well yesterday. That transfiguration is not transformation. You know, transformation, when I was thinking about it, you know, it can actually be either good or bad. You know, there's no guarantee that something will be transformed into something good. You know, I was thinking, you know, we can probably all agree that a, that a caterpillar changing into a butterfly, transforming itself, that's probably a good thing. Most people like butterflies. But tadpoles changing into frogs, that may not be good for everyone. Nope, some people don't like frogs. They were even one of the plagues of Egypt. Yuck. There's no guarantee. Transfiguration, however, I think does provide that guarantee. For never, ever, is transfiguration about us. It is always about God. We're the ones who reap all the benefits of it, but we are not the ones who do it. God has already done it. And Jesus showed us how. And what we can expect. That something beautiful can appear in our lives no matter where we are in our lives. When Moses appeared with Jesus, he was transfigured. Still representing the old way, but coming forward now into a new way. The old way of praying and doing, doing religion. Jesus brought us forward into a new way. Elijah stood there representing the, both the old way, both the, the way of rules and norms and expectations. Let me say that again. Elijah stood there as someone who brought forward with him, this is the way we did things, this is the way we've done, we're going to keep doing things, and we're going to get this out of it. Jesus came to announce that a new way has been found. That yes, the Messiah has come, and there's a new way we can move forward and leave behind all of those expectations and rules that kept us so closed up for so long. And Jesus, he's the bridge to all of this. Our bridge between what we have been allowed and expected to say and do and act like during the stages of our lives and the grief of our lives. Because normally those things that we're expected to do they're to make other people feel comfortable around us. So Jesus is our bridge between all of those old expectations and our new realities. And when we embrace Jesus as this bridge in our lives, we will see the glory and the beauty that already exists in our lives. Not because we'll suddenly think that death and loss is beautiful, but because God is beautiful. And as children of God, we are beautiful. And just as we are beautiful, everything we bring with us is beautiful. And therefore, everything we are, everything we carry, is lifted by God's strength out of darkness and hiding and into glory and light. I guess what I'm trying to say this morning is that you are not alone. For not only is God with you, through everything, but those of us who follow Jesus, 
will follow you through everything as well. And together, we will experience a transfiguration of our lives, becoming even more beautiful than we could have ever dreamed. The goal now, my goal and hopefully yours, is to allow God to show us how to be and do this. How to be with one another. How to see beauty in grief. How to see light through darkness. How to live openly with all that we are. It can be done. Because it has been done. We just need to believe that it was done for us. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, out of a cloud you spoke and declared that Jesus is your beloved Son, to whom we should listen. Speak to us in that same holy voice, telling us that we too are your beloved children. Grant us the courage and the humility to trust and follow Jesus wherever our paths might lead us. For you are, to, you are to be found in all the places we journey. The places we want to go and the places we don't. Both to the mountaintops and down into those valleys and all the terrain in between. Lord, we pray this day that your grace and mercy fall upon all those who think they have missed it, feel that we are not worthy of it, or don't even know a thing about it. For the pain of this world is great, but the relief of your love is greater. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My friends, let us sit for a moment in silence with God. Amen. Yeah.